Good afternoon and welcome to this year's IMICE Airspace Board AGM lecture today. Um, for today, the copy of the annual report of the division is available on the resource tab to be downloaded by anybody in attendance. Please could I invite people to read the report and provide any feedback to the contact Jay Reed on the report, um, please. So uh, without further ado, um, I would like to introduce you to our guest presenter today, David Debney, Chief Engineer, Whole Aircraft Integration at FlyZero ATI. Uh, before joining the FlyZero project in January, David was ATI's Head of Technology for Whole Aircraft, where he was responsible for um, future assessment of integration of aircraft technology. Um, and previously, David also worked as Chief of Future Aircraft Concepts at Rolls-Royce, where he was responsible for developing concept designs for hybrid propulsion systems on aircraft of all sizes. So with that, I'll hand it over to David and I can start off his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. It's great to be here today. And uh, I'll talk you through a bit more detail on the Fly Zero project. Uh, what we've been up to and some of the things that to, to look out for over the next few months as we start to release our findings. What I'd like to start with is a short video just sort of summarising what we're looking at on Fly Zero. So hopefully this works. Led by the Aerospace Technology Institute and backed by the UK government, Fly Zero is a one-of-a-kind research project aiming to realise zero carbon emission air travel by the end of the decade. A team of experts from across UK aerospace and academia is working to develop the new technologies that we will need to propel the next generation of aircraft into our skies. And by fusing these technologies together, to create and evaluate a fleet of groundbreaking new concepts, ATI Fly Zero is defining a truly sustainable future for the aircraft, airports and airspace of tomorrow, as the global aviation industry looks to a brighter, greener future, Fly Zero will help the UK stand at the forefront of sustainable flight in design, manufacture, technology and skills for years to come. A new dawn for aviation is on the horizon. So there's the video and that nicely summarizes what we're trying to achieve on Fly Zero. And I'm going to talk through that in a little bit more detail now. But before we get into the detail of Fly Zero itself, what I thought it would be worth doing is actually taking a step back and looking at sort of the aviation picture more broadly. So aviation is a vital part of the UK economy. The number of jobs that it supports is huge, and also lots of those jobs are high value jobs. So that's something that's very valuable to the government and, and the economy. 40% of UK trade is transported by air. Certainly up until COVID hit, Heathrow was the largest port in the UK by value. So in terms of the, the value of the goods being imported at that location, and if anything, if you look at current freight prices for, for current air freight prices, the value of air freight has, has gone up dramatically since then, although I suspect that's partly because of the lower number of flights. The number of passengers that aviation transports around the world is staggering. In a year, in a typical year, four and a half billion passengers, of which 250 million odd travel through UK airports. Now, something else that's interesting about the UK and the aviation industry is that from a UK perspective, a vast amount of the available seat kilometres are from international flights rather than domestic. For those of you that aren't familiar with that metric, an available seat kilometre is a measure of, it's basically the number of seats times by the distance flown. Um, and it's a common metric used in, in aviation to, to represent capacity. The key point here is that the UK is a very international 
aviation industry. Most of our flights are going from the UK elsewhere. And whilst we do have some flights that are, that are domestic, in terms of the ASKs and therefore the associated emissions, they're actually a very small part. And most importantly, for if you're looking at it from a government um, investment and economy perspective, inbound tourists, while there were still some coming, uh, contributed a huge amount of, of money to UK GDP. The UK is the third largest nation. If you look at the available seat kilometers globally, the chart on the left shows that we're third behind the US and China. And it's, it's also interesting to look on that chart, as I was talking about earlier, the split between the different countries and the domestic versus the international capacity that they, that they have. So we've looked at why aviation is important to the UK economy. And this is, this is an important place to start because what it says is that aviation is vital to protect. We all need to think about how we live more sustainably. And that drives us to say, well, okay, it's not necessarily just about flying less. It's about how do we fly more sustainably to enable, to continue to enable the global trade and connectivity that aviation has almost single-handedly enabled in the last 50 to 60 years. So now I'd like to take a look at the carbon challenge more specifically. So as, as of today, aviation contributes around 2% of global CO2 emissions and about 3.5% to the climate warming effect overall. Uh, and the, the reason those two numbers are different is because CO2 is one part of the, cli you know, the climate change picture. You also have things like NOx, contrails and other things. Aviation's contribution is currently expected to grow, mainly based on traffic growth projections out to 2050, 2060. Obviously at the moment, the numbers are a little bit down from, from where they were projected to be, but all the indications are that aviation traffic is, is rapidly coming back up towards uh, where those projections it suggested it would go. In addition to that, other industries are also decarbonizing via electrification and other routes. So it's not as though aviation can claim the problem is too hard and sit there and do nothing. Contrails are a very interesting one. So some of the, the recent reports that have come out on climate science have suggested that persistent contrails are actually a bigger contributor to global warming or the climate warming effect than CO2. And if you look at those, it, it's actually quite interesting that it's only 2.2% of flights that cause up to about 80% of those contrails. So there are companies out there um, looking at means to overcome that with existing aircraft through intelligent flight routing. Um, and it may be that we need to change some of the design parameters of aircraft in terms of cruise altitude to reduce the formation of those contrails. The point on this slide is just to reinforce that it isn't necessarily all about carbon, although that's the, uh, the contributor to climate warming that we understand the best. So the other point to make is that if you look at those climate reports, they also have a considerable margin of uncertainty around the warming effect of those contrails, for example. And similar to the point made on the previous slide, the scale of the challenge is vast. The aviation industry spends around a hundred billion pounds on fuel each year. And just to look at one example from the UK, 22 million litres of kerosene was used at Heathrow every day in 2019. Now, in this context, as we'll talk about later in the presentation, there are multiple pathways that you can look at becoming more sustainable, but Fly Zero wanted to set an ambitious target from the start, and therefore our chosen target was zero tailpipe carbon emissions for the Fly Zero aircraft that we're looking to develop and the underpinning technologies. So that brings me nicely on to explaining a bit more about the Fly Zero project. 
The Fly Zero team is made up of various experts from the companies shown on the screen. And we do have a number of independent uh, employees that are directly employed by ATI that applied separately. The point of what we've achieved on Fly Zero, though, is different to traditional ATI projects and Clean Sky and other collaborative funding models in that we've directly seconded people into a central team. And so that enables them to collaborate in a much more open way than it would do if they were still sat in their parent companies collaborating. It did require some careful negotiation on things like intellectual property and you know commercial uh, commercially sensitive material and how that was managed but i think it's been well worth it and certainly i would hope if you speak to anybody in the team we've managed to generate a really good collaborative team spirit and this is also despite entirely working remotely from the start of the fly zero program having said that the remote working has generated an advantage in that we've been able to uh, have people working on Fly Zero from all across the UK, from all of the home nations, which would have been much more difficult if we had one or two central office locations. So personally, it's been really nice to bring all the different expertise together and leverage the different experience and skills and knowledge that people have in a collaborative way for the benefit of the UK. The final thing to say is that Fly Zero is 100% funded by the UK government. And as such, the key reports that Fly Zero generates, and we're talking about 60 odd, will be released at the end of the project for the benefit of the UK. And more details will be released on that nearer the time. Uh, but it is something that is important that we look to share the information and the knowledge that we've generated. So where are we focusing our efforts? It's fairly common in the aerospace industry to segment the market into different uh, sectors. We made a conscious decision at the start of the project that we weren't going to look at sub-regional or eVTOL aircraft for a couple of reasons. The first is that if you look at their contribution to aviation emissions overall, it's very small. In the case of eVTOL aircraft, there aren't, many, there aren't any flying in service today and certainly sub-regional aircraft, it's a very small contribution. This sector actually is quite well funded at the moment. So the likes of Lilium, Joby, Vertical Aerospace in the UK have all managed to put together pretty uh, sizable in investment propositions that have come to, come to light recently. So arguably that sector is doing pretty well on its own and didn't need any help. We've then chosen to look at the uh, the segment in the middle. So typically what people would call regional, single island, mid-size aircraft. So regional aircraft in this, for, for this purpose, we're defining as kind of 50 seats or above. And a mid-size aircraft is a 757767. Um, it's kind of slightly between your A32737 and your 777A350 that sit above it. Um, but it will become clear why we've chosen to, to bring out that segment specifically later in the presentation. And finally, the, the really long haul twin aisle aircraft we're not looking at because we're not doing active research into sustainable aviation fuel. We recognize that we need to understand how zero carbon energy sources compare to sustainable fuel, but we're not actively studying the technology behind SAF itself. So when we started the project, we tried to break the problem down. And the approach we took was to look at what we're calling technology bricks, some of which are, you know, the key ones are shown on the screen at the moment. And we'll pick a few to go through in a bit more detail. But we wanted to look at all the zero carbon options. So hydrogen, both gaseous and liquid. We've also looked at ammonia and we've looked at battery electric. And then we also had brainstorming sessions on what else could possibly power an aircraft from a zero carbon perspective. And, you know, no uh, possible solution was overlooked. But when you start getting into things like nuclear, it very quickly becomes apparent that that's not a sensible option anytime soon. 
So when we when we were looking at these zero carbon energy sources, um, we have, we did a direct assessment at the early stage of what what it meant from an energy perspective, and we'll come on to what the uh, outcome from that was in a later slide. But it covers all parts of the aircraft. So if you're going to a zero carbon technology, for the example of liquid hydrogen, cryogenic systems is a fairly unique branch that aerospace has no expertise in today. And actually that generated a challenge for us as a project. Where, do, where could we source expertise to help us understand what that meant? You also then have to think about other aspects of it. If you're having zero carbon fuels that have different properties, both in terms of volume or mass, where do you store those in the aircraft? What does that mean from a configuration perspective? That then has a knock on effect potentially on things like handling and stability. We also wanted to make sure we looked at underpinning technologies. So things like materials. So again, going to cryogenic environments introduces some pretty unique challenges on the materials themselves. Life cycle management is another important one. Can you make a difference to an aircraft's carbon footprint by choosing certain materials at the point of manufacture? Having looked at it, the majority of emissions are generated from operation in an aircraft service life. Around 95% come from the, you know, the service life itself, but it is still an important thing to look at, in addition to recycling at end of life. Emissions impact modeling is related to what we talked about earlier with things like contrail formation and understanding impacts of NOx and particulates, because it's actually, it needs to be a holistic picture. And finally, what we're calling operational technologies. So if you're going to alternative fuel supplies, airports, air traffic management, all of these different things all play a part. So when we took our technology bricks, we built those technology bricks into a series of aircraft that we're calling our scout aircraft. These are a range of these are shown on the screen at the moment. And the idea was to consider all different ideas with all different configurations from where, you know, how would you have an ammonia solution to a separate fuselage to put hydrogen in, to engine position, to blended wing bodies, to integrated sort of hydrogen storage and cell pods, to clean wings, to conjoined box wings, to distributed propulsion, to sort of twin boom fuselages for hydrogen storage. So we've, we, we tried to look at all the possible combinations that we could. And we went through a pretty significant scoring process where we scored against different criteria, all the different scout aircraft to look at which ones we thought were the most promising. And we also worked with a couple of different organizations to get some independent views on that to make sure that we weren't introducing bias unnecessarily. So at the end of that scout phase, we, we sort of pulled everything together to do an assessment of the different options for zero carbon fuels. So in summary, we're looking at batteries, fuel cells, combustion and gaseous hydrogen, ammonia and sustainable aviation fuel for the purposes of comparison. So from a CO2 perspective, everything apart from SAF on this list is zero tailpipe emissions. There are potentially emissions from the production of energy, but for now, we're, we're putting that to one side. SAF is amber as it's not zero CO2 emission, it's net zero. So yes, you have to capture carbon to make it, but you are still emitting there or thereabouts the same amount of carbon into the atmosphere. From a NOx perspective, the battery and the fuel cell are zero, so that's good. From a combustion perspective of uh, hydrogen, there's there's a we think there's a probability that you can do better on NOx than you do today with kerosene, uh, and that's why there's a mixture of green and amber. That's still a technology that we're investigating in terms of hydrogen combustion. We think there's a, a possibility for better mixing and shorter residence time, but you have to watch your peak temperatures, and if you get end up with hot spots, that can introduce additional NOx. From an ammonia point of view, um, that 
is likely to produce NOx given that there's nitrogen inherent in ammonia in addition to the nitrogen in the air. And again, SAF is amber because the evidence is that SAF is slightly better than kerosene at NOx, uh, but it's definitely not zero. From a contrails perspective, uh, a battery is very good because you're not emitting anything. From a hydrogen perspective, um, hydrogen does emit more water than kerosene as a result of the combustion equation. However, what it doesn't have um, are things like soot particles, um, which act as nucleation points in the formation of contrails. So at the moment, the evidence is still being assessed, but we think that whilst additional water is emitted, the contrails are likely to be different optically and also less dense because of that difference in formation. From a SAF perspective, it does have lower particulates than kerosene, so that's also amber, but it does have some particulates that are likely to, to come out. From a fuel volume perspective, uh, battery struggles and gaseous H2 struggles. Liquid hydrogen is just about okay, but nowhere, but still nowhere near as good as SAF. So from an overall perspective, because hydrogen is lighter from per, per unit mass, uh, for a given amount of energy, hydrogen is better, but it's worse per unit volume, you end up with about 3.7 times the volume to get hydrogen equivalent in terms of energy to, to SAF or kerosene. And in terms of the system mass, so this is the fuel and the propulsion system. So this is where battery really struggles. And I'm sure that won't come as a surprise to some of the audience. And that effectively rules it out from carrying a significant payload any significant distance if you look at it from the global aviation perspective. The fuel cell, the power density of a fuel cell is not as good as a gas turbine when you're up at a sizable aircraft, but the power density of a fuel cell is maintained to a smaller size where the gas turbine drops off. So it's a mixture of green and amber because it depends on the size of aircraft you're looking at. From a combustion perspective, hydrogen actually ends up looking reasonably good. From a gaseous hydrogen perspective and an ammonia perspective, the weight ends up being a real challenge. So from an ammonia perspective, combusting it directly is, is rather challenging. If you want it to combust effectively, you need a mixture of hydrogen and ammonia to be going into the combustion chamber. At that point, you have two options. You can either carry the hydrogen directly or you can split it from the ammonia on board, but that then comes at a penalty of additional equipment that you need to carry. From the mass perspective, SAF looks very good which shouldn't come as a surprise. We've also had to look at investment. So both in terms of the technology and the infrastructure required. So battery is amber, so that's pretty good. Hydrogen, unsurprisingly, especially from a liquid perspective, that's the real challenge. Um, finding, making sure that you can build and develop the liquid hydrogen infrastructure, if that's the route you go down, both in terms of production and supply, and also getting it in terms of transporting to the airport and then putting it into the aircraft itself. Gaseous hydrogen, there are existing solutions that automotive have come up with. And likewise with ammonia, there are industrial uses. And SAF, we put as amber. Uh, from the actual infrastructure perspective itself, um, transporting it is easy because you use the same infrastructure as kerosene. But if you're looking at things like power to liquid, there is a significant technology investment needed in carbon capture, which is often overlooked when considering SAF. And from a cost perspective, battery is good. Hydrogen actually is medium, and it depends on, you know, there are multiple projections out there at what the cost will do over time. As ever, it's likely to depend on the demand. And SAF, from a power to liquid perspective, actually ends up being more expensive than kerosene and more expensive than just using hydrogen directly as you actually need to put hydrogen in when you're making the SAF. So essentially, 
The analysis that we've done, and we've released a primary energy fuels paper, which is available on the ATI website, which goes into a little bit more detail as to the rationale, is that we're looking at green liquid hydrogen from a zero carbon perspective. That's where we've chosen to focus the effort on fly zero. Now, as we talked about, effectively, the direct competitor to that is the, is the different pathways of SAF. And we don't think it's a, an either or discussion. We think actually you need to do both. And we'll come back to that later on. So having gone through the scouts, gone through the uh, primary energy source, source assessment, we've then moved on to developing three aircraft concepts <coughs> in Fly Zero. So those three concepts <coughs> are split across different market segments. The first is in the regional space. So we're looking at about 70 seats. And we've chosen to target this aircraft to be designed around a fuel cell system to see if how, how, you know, how competitive can that system be in that space. Actually, the key challenge that we're finding there is thermal management. So getting rid of the, of the waste heat from the fuel cell and transporting it to where it needs to be is the big challenge that we're finding on that air, aircraft concept at the moment. We've also got a, a concept in the narrowbody space. Narrowbodies, so this is single aisle or a, you know, A320s, 737s. Today, these are the workhorses of commercial aviation and the fastest growing segment. So the key question here is, could a liquid hydrogen compete with a SAF powered you know, A320 or future variation of that kind of aircraft? The big challenge for this segment is the turnaround time. So these are aircraft are used by lots of low cost carriers. And so they have very stringent requirements, typically the target of 30 minutes to turn around the aircraft between flights. And if that turnaround time were to, to, to dramatically extend, that's time spent on the ground where the airlines aren't earning revenue. So that's something that we're actively looking at. And then typically the received wisdom today is that hydrogen can only go up to a single aisle, if that, and serve relatively short routes. So we wanted to challenge that paradigm and say, could we do something in the mid-size space. So remember, this is the 767, 757, middle of the market. Airbus doesn't really have a direct competitor to do that, to, to that today, although the A321 extra long range is, is definitely pushing up into that space, although that is a single aisle aircraft. So here we've set ourselves a challenge that we're wanting to look at longer distance routes. So what do we mean by longer distance? Something like transatlantic, although we're still exact, it was still uh, assessing exactly what that range will be. And we're looking to announce something on that in the near future. The challenge when you start getting into the longer range is accommodating the required fuel volume. So if you remember, hydrogen occupies additional volume relative to kerosene for the same amount of energy while maintaining a decent level of aerodynamic efficiency. Because if you, if you kill the aerodynamic efficiency, particularly as you're flying further distance, that ultimately generates additional drag, which needs more fuel, and then you get into a challenging design cycle. So now I'd like to talk a bit more about the narrowbody concept specifically. So we have shared this one in, in public previously. So this is the same size as an, a, as an A320-737 in terms of passenger capacity. So single class, it's about 180 passengers. The hydrogen is stored in two tanks in the rear of the fuselage. You, we've looked at it and for various reasons, you can't store it in the wing, but that then introduces technology opportunity. So going to a dry wing, a dry clean wing, means that you can exploit different structural technology and different aerodynamic techniques to, to optimize that wing. One of the challenges actually is similar to the, the long distance aircraft we talked about, the midsize, maintaining the balance. So on this aircraft, we've chosen to add a canard at the front and go to a three surface configuration to make sure that we can maintain trim and balance within acceptable limits as the fuel burns off. The aircraft has a twin turbofan powered by hydrogen arrangement. And currently those positioned at the rear of the aircraft, they're located 
to try and take some advantage of boundary layer ingestion aerodynamics, which is using the slightly lower velocity flow right next to the fuselage. The final thing that we've introduced on this aircraft to challenge people to think about it is a tapered fuselage section. And we've done that to try and introduce a bit more natural laminar flow. As of today, the fuselage typically makes up about 40% of, of the drag of an aircraft. And it's, it's an area that typically you know, is just accepted by the aircraft design community. So we wanted to, again, just be a bit thought provoking and challenge the paradigm and just make people think about what, what could be achieved if you had a different configuration option on the aircraft. So just to touch on some of the additional challenges that we've also uncovered, and we've touched on some of these earlier in the presentation. So from an operational perspective, if you're going to go to a, a hydrogen aircraft, a liquid hydrogen aircraft, you know, how effectively can you make the liquid hydrogen? Do you do it remotely? Do you do it on site at the airport? Do you use gaseous hydrogen to ship and then liquid, you know, you have a liquefaction plant at the air, airport? All of these things and the cost element are important. We also need to remember that aviation shouldn't be considered in isolation. So many other industries are also either looking at hydrogen as a potential route to decarbonize or already use hydrogen for things like chemical processes. The fact that it's cryogenic introduces additional challenges. So how do you manage that from a safety perspective? And that ties into the regulations, which we'll come back to in a second. The supply chain perspective, if you're going to different technologies, if you're going to different part, you know, things like hydrogen, if you're going to different materials, is the UK in a strong position to address these challenges? More on that on the next slide. Sustainability. So we've talked about carbon, we've talked about NOx, we've talked about particulates, we've talked about contrails. I would also class noise as an emission from an aircraft. So we need to try and make sure that we don't increase the noise level from these aircraft, which may or may not be as straightforward as we think. Um, you know, in, if you start changing the configuration, if you start changing the weight of the aircraft and the drag, that has a direct, a direct impact on the noise. Most importantly, we want to make sure that we don't solve one problem by going to zero carbon fuels and introducing an alternative sustainable problem, sustainability problem, which we need to address in the future. And policy and regulation. So lots has been talked about cost in terms of the hydrogen fuel. Some people are projecting that, you know, a competition between kerosene and hydrogen or kerosene and SAF where the kerosene doesn't become more expensive in future. It's not necessarily clear to me at this point that that's a safe assumption. That could be through policy in terms of frequent flyer levies, fuel taxation, or whatever it might be. Or different industries reducing their dependency on kerosene, meaning that a greater percentage of the production costs need to be borne by the aerospace industry. And finally, regulation. So we're working with the CAA and the health and safety executive to look at how existing regulations may change if you're wanting to look at a liquid hydrogen solution. And that's obviously both in terms of the sort of aircraft design regulations today, sustainability regulations, so CS34, but also the safety regulations. And that's why I've got the health and safety executive involved, because when you're looking at ground handling and other aspects of that, they also have a key, play to part, a key part to play. And why is this relevant from a UK perspective? So if we look at technology maturity in the UK position, some of the key technologies are shown on the left-hand side here. And in some of these key areas, the UK in conventional technology is in a leading position compared to the rest of the world. And that's a key point in maintaining our global position, both in terms of the number of jobs, but also economic value that the UK industry generates. If you look at where we are compared to the rest of the world from a hydrogen perspective, on some areas we're equal, on other areas, as a, to the best of, you know, uh, to the best that FlyZero can assess, it would appear that we're currently trailing. And that's why we're in active discussions with the UK government about um, increasing the amount of funding available through the ATI programme and other initiatives uh, 
to make sure that the UK can maintain its position at the forefront of uh, at the forefront of aerospace. And that's why the threat level, if we don't do anything in the near future, is high, because other countries are actively investing in these areas, and we can't afford for the UK to be left behind. The final thing is, if you look at uh, what Airbus are saying at the moment, they're saying they want a product and service in 2035. That means that UK companies need to have technology to a TRL5, TRL6 level of maturity by the mid 2020s, which in aerospace terms is not far away. So the time to act in terms of starting to develop these technologies from a UK perspective is very much now. And then what's FlyZero going to put out at the end of the project? So we've talked about the fact that these will be released. We're going to put out three zero carbon emission aircraft concepts. We've talked about those. We're also going to do an assessment of the market and economic benefits for the UK. That's both in terms of the potential maintaining of te technical roles and design jobs, but also in terms of hydrogen production and other things like that, which could be additional areas where the UK could that the UK could leverage. We're going to do a, try and do a, a, a comprehensive sustainability assessment for what the zero carbon concepts actually mean in, in all the aspects that we've talked about earlier. Most importantly, from a, a UK sort of aerospace industry perspective, we're going to put out some technology roadmaps that detail the work that we've done and the key areas where we think technology has promise and what technologies we think will make a difference to a zero carbon aircraft. And finally, we're going to put out an assessment of the UK's industrial capability relative to other nations to move to a zero carbon solution and the future industrialization requirements. So things like test infrastructure. If we're going to a liquid hydrogen future, what test infrastructure will we need in order to develop the systems, the technologies, the products that support that? And we need to start thinking about that now not when the technology programs end up being delayed because they realize too late they don't have it. So finally, I'd just like to sort of go back and summarize the initial findings that we've had so far on Fly Zero. The first is to achieve a tangible reduction in overall aviation emissions, your zero carbon solutions must have significant range and payload capability. Otherwise, you're just playing in the margins and not actually making any real difference. We think that green liquid hydrogen has the most potential of the zero carbon options to power a new generation of commercial aircraft. We recognize that that brings a number of challenges that are going to require concerted effort to overcome. However, the UK has a proud history of innovation in a whole range of engineering topics. And so we don't see why this should be any different to the challenges that the UK in engineering industry and capability has overcome previously. The Fly Zero project will outline some of the key challenges and technology roadmaps to signpost where we think that development needs to head. Most importantly, our strong view is that the aviation industry needs to pursue both liquid hydrogen and SAF at pace. You need SAF to decarbonize the existing fleet, which will still be in service for years to come, but it's only ever a net zero solution with SAF. And the scalability and the feasibility of doing that with power to liquid is not necessarily clear. So you have to start looking at a zero carbon option now in parallel. And overall, we also need to consider international collaboration and partners to address this challenge. Things like standards, things like production of hydrogen. It's no good that the UK does something on its own and ultimately aerospace is a global industry and our sales opportunities to large OEMs will come predominantly from an international arena. So that's covered an overview of the Fly Zero project and I hope you found it interesting. And this is ultimately, this slide is ultimately summarizing the message from an ATI perspective of where we feel we need to go in the future. We want to position the UK as a world leader in sustainable aviation technology. And I will reiterate that means both SAF and hydrogen from a zero carbon perspective. And that's where we'll be working, hopefully, with many of you through industry engagement, through government engagement, 
through professional body engagement to look at skills and how we need to develop those as we go through the next few years to really start moving to a more sustainable footing for aviation. So I'm going to finish my presentation there and uh, open the floor to a few questions. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, David, for that very interesting and informative presentation. Um, I've just checked the inbox there and there's a few questions that you could answer for us. Um, one of them is from David Bowles um, and he's asking why nuclear power was not considered suitable. Um, the main reason is, is back to weight. So the you can get relatively small reactors, but once you start having to put shielding in for radiation um, and all sorts of other things, the, the, the weight for a given power just scales very quickly way outside of what would be acceptable to put on an aircraft and maintain an acceptable payload. So we did look at it, but very simple sums get, you know, get, give you the answer on that topic. Perfect. Thanks. And the uh, next question is from Peter Hebert. Um, so he asks, COP26 worked well to focus governments and media's um, attention on the problem. But as engineers, our expertise in solving problems in practical and cost-effective ways, um, how are you managing to raise the profile of engineers as a source of solutions to the climate crisis? That's a really good question. Um, we are actively in discussion with various government departments and academia about the skills uh, that will be needed to develop the technologies that we've identified in Fly Zero. Some of those areas are consistent with evolutionary aircraft. Some of them, like cryogenics, are completely different. So we are active, and 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 it's and and it is engineering because it's how do you engineer those systems to be effective in products? Yes, there's a, a big element of chemistry when you're looking at cryogenics, but actually designing the system is where the engineers come in. So we are actively in conversation and highlighting those future needs if we're going to be successful at bringing a zero carbon solution to, to market. Um, and the, the other thing is, SAF also has an element of that because you know the production of SAF, how you optimize that, that you know, there are many in, innovative areas there. So both of the pathways that we're suggesting to government that we need to look at uh, do have a skills piece to them that we're trying to raise. Brilliant, thanks. Uh, next question is from Andrew Bradley. Um, so he asks, has aircraft noise for better or worse already been considered in the aircraft assessments? Also, has there been some learning in distance collaborative working such as uh, desperate systems use? Uh, so yes, we have considered aircraft noise. We've been working with Southampton University and the Institute for Sound and Vibration Research. Um, so there are various things that come into play with noise. It's quite a complex topic to understand. So we've done initial assessments. The aircraft configuration itself plays a big part um, where the engines are relative to various surfaces. You've also got to remember that most of the noise data is related to the certification test, which places the microphones at specific locations. Um, and you've got a few options. You can you know, climb more slowly, uh, which potentially requires less thrust, but then you're closer to the ground for longer. And the sound impact is an inverse square law for the distance. So a better option may be to take off and climb more steeply, which generates more noise close to the airport, but you're increasing the distance. And at this stage, it's still up for debate which one is the best option and we haven't made a final decision. But overall, as I said earlier, noise, if you're introducing more drag, if you're introducing more weight, fundamentally, they will be more additional challenge from a noise perspective because you're having to work the air harder. So, it, I don't think it would come as a surprise to you. DFT, in particular, from a government perspective, have pushed us to make sure that noise was a consideration when we were doing the concept designs. 
Thanks, David. So another question we have here from Anahita Laverick. Um, are there equivalent programs to Fly Zero in other countries and do they have a similar level of funding? Good question. So there are roughly equivalent uh, programs to Fly Zero. So DLR have a project called the Exact Program, which is doing something quite similar. And actually, if you look at what Clean Aviation, so this is the follow on from Clean Sky 2. So effectively, it's Clean Sky 3. Uh, that's an EU funded collaborative R&D effort. That's looking at similar things, although that's on a much bigger scale. Um, so yes, there are equivalent things. NASA are starting to look at what they might do from a zero carbon perspective, sort of following on from their evolutionary studies like sugar, um, although it's not clear exactly where they'll go with that. In terms of magnitude of investment, that's a key challenge for the UK at the moment. If you look at the level of investment that European nations, for example, are putting into zero carbon flight, it's significant. And that's partly why we're in discussions with the government at the moment about you know, funding for ATI and what that means. Because if we do want to maintain our position at the forefront of the global industry, we're going to need to push the development of these technologies and we need to do it soon. Thanks, David. Lots of questions coming in here now at the moment. Um, another one from Andrew Clark. Uh, what are the key challenges for liquid hydrogen fuel systems? Well, um, so it, the, the nature of cryogenic hydrogen, so liquid hydrogen is minus 253 degrees. So you have to manage things like boil off. So the, the tank will inherently take heat in from its surroundings which will cause some of the hydrogen to boil. That will then change the pressure in the tank and the mixture between gas and liquid. So you have to come up with a system to manage that. Pumping hydrogen is not straightforward. There are pumps that exist today for rocket engines, but obviously their life, typically they're kind of single use or very limited use. So that's a key challenge. Making sure that the transition from liquid hydrogen to gaseous so at what point do you transition or there are other phases such as supercritical which you have to consider um, materials is a key one so at cryogenic temperatures there are many materials challenges to think about things like many materials become brittle at such low temperatures hydrogen also has properties where it will embrittle certain metals and so that's something else you need to consider uh, valves shutting things off if you're sat in the sun in the Middle East for five hours on the ground obviously that changes the ambient conditions and the heat input to the system all of these things are things that we're actively looking at um, and then you have things like so you, then you have design choices so what's your system operating pressure what you know what technologies do you have for storage and the and the pipes themselves there are different types of insulation. There are different architectures in terms of that insulation that you can choose. And as with any engineering problem, each of them have their own pros and cons. So it's trying to work out how you optimize the system overall. So that's just, you know, we've had a, a team of people doing months of work on this. So I, I'm probably doing them a disservice by giving such a high level overview, but hopefully it kind of helps you to, to understand some of the challenges. Okay. Um, I have a few related questions, so I'm just going to pick one here about um, from David Coleman. Uh, takeoff and initial climb typically require the highest power delivery to achieve rapid altitude gain. Are we considering any systems that enable you to decouple vital cruise efficiency from the demands to, of takeoff and climb? For example, a hybrid system, whereby a secondary system provides extra power just for takeoff and climb. So yes. So we, that, that was one of the key challenges that we set the engineering team early in the project as a kind of brainstorming idea. So we ran what we called innovation challenges where we'd kind of set different questions and anyone in the project could submit ideas. And also, most importantly, actually, anyone else in the project could take that idea and help them develop it. Because when you're looking at innovative solutions, the best answers come from collaborative work you know, it's very unusual that one person finds the answer on their own. So we have looked at it. 
there are various challenges to that. Um, so one potential solution, for example, would be to have a, an electrical boost system. But if you're the, the levels of power and energy that you're con you're considering with an aircraft taking off to, uh, are significant. To put it into context, a single aisle at takeoff is using about 20 megawatts of power. And, you know, a larger aircraft could be 50, 60, 70 megawatts. And so very quickly, if you look at an electrical system, the size and the weight kill the idea. The other challenge is things like gas turbines. Um, if you look at how they operate at sea level and how they operate at altitude, actually they have a serendipitous effect where, because as you go up in altitude, they, they, the performance changes, but actually it has a convenient effect whereby you're still operating at a reasonable operating point in the thermodynamic cycle. So you don't change the efficiency too much. One of the challenges is if you downsize, say, a gas turbine or you operate it at part power, um, that actually is quite a good way to make it inefficient. So it is something that we've actively looked at. We haven't actually found anything in a hybrid sense that, that is better than just picking a particular type of propulsion drivetrain and sticking with it and optimizing it on its own. But we remain open minded. You know, these are the kind of things that need to be continued to be investigated after the end of the Fly Zero project. Thanks, David. Um, next question is from Robert Cummings. So he asks, what linkages to automotive and rail sectors regarding hydrogen production is there? Uh, I'm both of these sectors are looking at hydrogen. That's absolutely right. Um, so in terms of hydrogen production, there's some linkage. So we have looked at if those sectors were to go to a, a bigger hydrogen balance, if you like, what would that do to overall production numbers? How would that be scalable if you were making sure that it's green hydrogen? So the different types of hydrogen are split into colors. Don't ask me why. Um, but we think, you know, it's vital that we focus on green hydrogen in our view. Um, so we have looked at what you know, percentage aviation might be for different demand scenarios in an overall hydrogen perspective. There are some lessons to be learned from things like refueling, but at the moment, automotive has only used gaseous hydrogen as a solution at 350 or 700 bar tends to be the standards that they go for. They haven't done very much at all in a liquid hydrogen sense. And fundamentally, I think that's because they don't need to push to that extra sort of volumetric density uh, because they don't have the same mass challenges that, and that aviation does. Thanks, David. Um, we've got one around uh, certification. Um, Richard Simpkins asks, uh, will future landscape include all new certification standards for hydrogen propulsion systems or modification of existing ones, uh, which relevant are focused on kerosene gas turbine technologies and risks? So that's absolutely true. Um, and we've been actively working with the CAA to look at our initial to form an initial view of where the regulations are acceptable today and where they may need to change. Now, actually, if you look at the certification regulations from an av for, for aviation, what they tend to do is define a broad intent. So if you take levels of safety, for example, it defines a level of safety as the uh, like a rate of incident per flying hour. So actually, that kind of approach can easily be read across to a hydrogen aircraft. What may change is the acceptable means of compliance or how you design the system in order to achieve that level of safety. So as you'd expect, in a lot of ways, the devil's in the detail. But again, that's why we need to start now. And that's why we've been working with, with uh, the, the CAA. There are also various working groups from SAE, EuroCHI, the FAA and EASA, and the CAA are involved with these as well, actively looking to set what are considered acceptable standards and practices for hydrogen fuel systems, for battery electric systems and, and other aspects. So we have tied into those sort of standards bodies as well. Thanks, David. Um, and another question, um, Paul uh, Bentar 
um, asks, how are you plan to engage with the industry when you will be developing all the technologies you present today? Is that through different universities only? So no, we're, we're already directly engaging with industry to talk about what's needed to take these technologies to the next step. Um, and we've done various webinars through the Fly Zero program and we'll be doing one or two more. Um, but as I say, all the re key reports from Fly Zero will be made available to anyone from UK industry, not just the Rolls Royces, the Airbuses, but anybody from UK industry will be able to access them. Um, and so hopefully that's a key way of spreading the knowledge and learning that we've gained. And also hopefully it will in help encourage some collaboration. As you'd expect, we're also talking to academia um, because they also play a key part in how we develop the technologies, certainly the, the ones that are at an earlier stage in the life cycle. So it, it, it's, a, it's a case of both. We're, we're actively engaging. So the ATI has obviously has a good network with some existing aerospace companies. We're trying to bring in new mechanisms such as the webinars to, to, to tap into the broader UK network um, to help with that and we'll continue to do so. So if there are specific questions or you're looking for more information, if you go to the ATI website, uh, there are specific Fly Zero, you know, information email addresses that you can contact and we'll make sure that we send you information as and when it's available and information about webinars and things like that. Thanks, David. And just one final question, I'll leave you at B. Um, what skills will a 2030 aerospace engineer need to work on a zero carbon emission aircraft? That's a brilliant question. I think at a fundamental level, the skills aren't that different in terms of critical thinking, making sure you understand the problem. Um, I think that one of the risks as we go to more and more sort of MBSE or uh, you know, computer-aided engineering type solutions is that the person operating those tools loses sight of what the tool is actually doing and effectively just turns the handle and churns the numbers out. And that's critical, especially when you're starting to look at new technology, that you understand what's going on under the bonnet of that tool and critically assess the answers that it's giving you to question whether you believe them or not, rather than just swallowing them at face value. And I think actually that skill, that 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 approach applies whether it's a SAF aircraft or a hydrogen aircraft or whatever. So for me, that's probably the most important thing to, to for young engineers to consider as they're coming through their careers is make sure you get that technical grounding in the first few years because that's what will support you through the rest of your career in terms of technical knowledge you know once you get to a certain level you don't have the ability to go back and delve into that detail so it's really important to gain those skills early on in terms of specific technologies um, systems engineering is an well systems engineering is an obvious one but starting to think about um, cryogenics and what that generates so the fluid mechanics of pumping hydrogen through a pipe novel turbo machinery solutions and when i say turbo it's things like pumps um, how that would have impact a gas turbine so I, I don't think the fundamental skills as i say in the approach change that much it's just some of the different areas where you might want to look at in terms of things like materials and they, they come to the fore a bit more but but broadly speaking if you can do solid engineering and critical thinking you're always going to be in demand as an engineer in my view Thanks, David. I think we're just about out of time. So just to thank you again for a very interesting and informative presentation. Uh, and thanks for all the, the questions and interest that uh, our members have shown in the, the chats as well. So thank you very much. You're welcome.